today I'm talking to a guy that made $16,000 in his first month as a remote closer. My commission ended up being just over $16,000 US. And he's come a long way because he started his work life as a construction worker. What I did the longest before sales was construction, funny enough. We talked a lot about his journey on how he's been able to build a bulletproof mindset from a really young age and some tips on how you can do that as well. It taught me a level of discipline throughout that time where there was no accepting failure. Like if there's a way for it to happen or there's a way that it might be able to happen, you try your damn best to make that happen. And we also touched on the freedom that comes with being a remote closer and how that freedom is going to allow him to be present in his newborn daughter's life coming later this year in September. I'm having my first baby in September. Knowing that if something did happen to them, I can relate to that heavily because like I can just say, I'm off tomorrow, boys. And no one's gonna tell me not to do that. So if you're excited to see this episode, make sure to sit back, relax, and enjoy. So dude, before we jump too deep into the whole story, how's how's the day been so far? I know you're you're just getting the day started. So how how you doing so far? You know, it's beautiful. Woke up, the wife handed me a cup of coffee, made me some fresh banana bread. So I'll tell you what, I'm really enjoying the day so far. And now I get to chat with you. Yeah, I love it, man. You can't you can't beat the the early morning banana bread. So <laughs> Um, exactly. dude, I'm, I'm excited to, you know, to have this conversation because, you know, I reached out to you a couple of days ago and, you know, I, I always love like the really long, like drawn out win posts in the, uh, in the school group, because it just gives a lot of context behind, like, not only like what you've been able to do, but I think it also just like sheds a light on not only, yeah, what you've been able to do, but also like just how much effort and work you've put in over the last, you know, two or three months since you've been, been an RCA. So, you know, we're going to talk a lot about that and the specifics and give some, some really tangible advice for people that are listening that, that want to either get into remote closing or, you know, at least learn a little bit more about it. Um, let's like, let's take, let's, let's rewind the clocks. Let's go all the way back. You've been in, you were in sales for, or have been in sales for a while, but what were you doing even before sales? And like, what, what was like the transition into the whole industry and go back as, as far as you want? Sure. So I suppose what I did the longest before sales was uh, construction, funny enough. So <laughs> working on building houses and yeah, building houses out in the country, out in the middle of nowhere where I grew up in Canada, um, built houses for folks. And that's kind of where the whole journey began. But then from there, I, I quickly realized I didn't enjoy being in the cold. <laughs> I uh, I had to get out of Canada and I ended up moving across and ended up going to New Zealand, which is where I currently yes. live now. Yeah. And from there, I got into um, I got into hospitality. So I started working hospitality. I was a bartender for a while. I'm classic. I think any salesman, if they come from the hospitality world. Yeah. <laughs> Five, five years as a as a server on my end, so I can. I can yeah, there we go, mate. There we go, and, and exactly that. You know, I I absolutely loved it. And the thing I loved about most about it was just talking to people, communicating constantly, just having like being the center of attention in a lot of ways, where just people are coming up to me, they're wanting to chat with me, and just continuing to do that. So that was me historically before sales. Okay, gotcha. And and how how long did you do that? Uh, I was bartending for about a year and a half, be a year and a half. I was in there. Okay, yeah. cool. So you, you got out, got out quick then. I, I talked to a lot of people in like the service industry and it's, you know, at least for me, um, I, I live in like a pretty like touristy area. So like the summers were like really good. It's like you were, you know, you were doing bad if you weren't finished, like a fish, finishing a night at like 600 bucks, like just in, in tips. Right. And it's like, it's hard to, to leave that sometimes you just get kind of like wrapped into it. So I'm glad you didn't stay, you know, longer than you know, a lot of people have with their, with their stories. Um, so, okay. So what was the transition like out of, out of that? Did you go from that directly into sales or like, what was the, what was the next step there? Yeah, so it, it had always been like a passion of mine to be a personal trainer, <laughs> okay? And I had been like training clients and everything, but like unofficially, you know, just training friends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And what I ended up doing was I, I left my job bartending because I wanted to go study personal training. And that was the plan. So gave my gave my resignation and everything in like May, okay? And then... May I was of, doing May that of for, what year? May of what year? Just so ooh. we have like a timeline. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so that's May of 2019. Yeah, nice. May of 2019. And that's when I gave kind of my notice period. Ended up going from there and like just working at the gym that I was training at and like learning at. And 
really, I just devoted my life to fitness. I was doing like five, six hours of training a day, whether it be my own or helping others. Oh man. <laughs> just living in the gym. And that was great. But I, I'm a big traveler. Like I said, I'm, I'm in New Zealand right now, right? And I had a trip planned with my dad to take him to Bali in September. Okay. Now, not September, October, October later that year. Okay. And it was coming up to August and I did not have the money for it. <laughs> okay. Oh, I had paid for our flights. I had paid for our accommodation, but I had nothing else. Like maybe like a hundred bucks to my name. Mm. So it was, it was a heck of a time. But what I ended up doing was I was like, all right, I need to, I need to find something. I was like, even if I have to work like a hundred hours, I didn't really know about um, commissions and things like this at the time. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, I knew if I grinded hard enough, I'd be able to make it. So that was the plan. And I was like, all right, I'll go work four jobs, work a hundred hours a week. We'll get it done. <laughs> um, and one of the jobs I ended up applying to, it was a door-to-door -door fundraising and door-to-door -door sales company. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting. I get out on the doors and and on my first day, like where you observe and you're just watching to see what they're doing. Yeah. The guy I'm with, he pops off like two two signups, two deals, and makes like 300 bucks in like a span of an hour. And then I was like, is that it? He's like, Yeah, yeah, you just do this all day. And I was like, <laughs> That's it. I was like, I was like, what? No way. Uh, ended up getting off, went, went with the manager. I, I was like, yeah, bro, I don't need to see anymore. I'm good. <laughs> I'm like, this is all set. Um, uh, I started with them the very next week. And the whole point I did that is because to go on my holiday, I needed to save like six and a half thousand dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. And obviously live during that next seven weeks as well. So I ended up working with them from day one till then. And I, I ended up just passing. So I need to make six and a half. I ended up making like 6.8 <laughs> to nice. say, which was sick, but it set me up to go on the vacation with dad, um, which was, you know, amazing to be able to go out there and treat my dad to a holiday and, and go, but that was the, my introduction into sales. That's how I yeah. first got started and the taste of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious, like what's, um, you know, a uh, really like, a big part that I see a lot of like uh, on these interviews that I have is like just a, uh, just like that, that almost like killer instinct, if you will, maybe that's not the best way to, to put it, but you know, when you were in that position of like, okay, I need to make money because of X, Y, and Z, I'm going to figure out how I, how I'm going to do that. Right. As opposed, as opposed to like, there's a lot of people out there that will, you know, they'll say, oh, like I need to make $6,000, but they're like, well, I don't know how that's even possible. And then they don't like, don't even try. So can you pinpoint like that mindset to anything specifically like from growing up or anything like that? Yeah, no, for sure. So I, I grew up in like my grandfather was in the military <laughs> for a long time. You know, he's air force for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up joining cadets when I was 12 back in Canada, okay, which is like the States um, ROTC mm -hmm. kind of similar thing. I joined that in Canada when I was 12 and I stayed in there until I was 17 and I was the um, RSM. So the regimental sergeant major, the guy in charge of everything, mm. which was really cool experience. Amazing. But it taught me a level of discipline throughout that time where there was no accepting failure. Like you, you do not accept that. That's not okay. If there's a way for it to happen or there's a way that it might be able to happen, you try your damn best to make that happen. So mm -hmm. I think that's where that attitude came from was just being able to continuously and constantly push yourself because they did that for me for my, I guess, the fundamental um, years as a teenager, you know? Mm -hmm. What what would you say to someone that uh, that's like almost that that wants to like live that in that same like mindset, but they they didn't go through something like that, right? Because I think that's. I mean, I mean, if you look at any like self-development motivation book, it's like, that's what it's focused on is like how to do the things that you don't want to do when you know you need to do it anyway. So anything that you can maybe give some tips. Yeah. The, a big lesson that I learned early on was build trust with yourself and don't ever break that trust. Because if you trust yourself and you build that up, you're very easily going to be able to transfer that over. Do you know what I mean? So it simply starts with, if you tell yourself in the morning, you're going to make your bed, just make your bed. I was like, I don't care if you get up early, you get up late, you're running late. 
spend 30 seconds, make your bed. Okay. okay. And you start to do something simple like that. And it sounds so cliche, but if you know, and you trust yourself over the course of a month, every single day you made your bed and you know, without thinking about it tomorrow, yeah, of course I'm going to make my bed. Why wouldn't I? And then you start to slowly up the ante. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this week I'm going to apply for four new jobs. Okay. And then you do that and you start to build up the trust. You know, this week I'm going to close one extra deal. And you slowly are building up that trust. You almost inherently have that killer mindset because you trust yourself. And I think that's the biggest place where people fail is they don't actually trust themselves to do what they say they're going to do because they all talk about like these big dreams, right? But big dreams are great. If you don't have action on them, that's all they are is ever dreams. Put some actions into place and make them goals. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's, that's huge. And, uh, there's one of the things that, uh, within our company that we just like make people go through is like, is that is like, if you can't, you know, especially if you're on like a sales call and you don't even have like that initial amount of conviction in yourself, like it's going to be very difficult. Like you said, to like relay that same trust and conviction behind the offer to the person that you're talking to, you know? So when you can fully live it yourself, you can you know translate the same mindset. So what, um, I guess what happened after that? So you come back from, from Bali. And, uh, so what was the, what was the next step? You stayed with the company for a little bit, I'm assuming. Yeah. So I came back and, and I had already said like, I'm done. <laughs> so when I went to Bali, I was like, nah, guys, that, that was it. You know, it was good fun. I'm yeah. going to go back to personal training now. Um, and I had like, I went to Bali in October. I came back end of November. So like six, six weeks. And I came back and I had like end of November. So yeah, I had like four or five weeks till Christmas time. And I was like, hmm, okay, I'll, I'll, I'd like a little bit more pocket money. I'll, I'll dive back in. I'll stay till Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> and and then at Christmas time, they ended up offering me like a team leader role um, where one of the head guys was leaving and he said, hey, if you want, you know, we can build you up a team and we can get you being the guy in charge of that. I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. So long story short is I ended up staying with him another year and a half. Okay. And just grinding, basically running the company with him. And what I did at that point was I opened up my own company and I actually started my own door to door company where I've been operating that the last 18 months, 19 months. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's me up to date, I suppose, before yeah. I got into remote closing. Nice. What was the, what was the door to door company that you opened? Same like product or same idea? Yeah, ex exactly. Same thing, mate. Uh, so we were doing door to door fundraising. So we work for like pretty major charities and get like their monthly donations for them. So we would do everything from, um, you know, make a wish. Yeah. 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 So I fundraise for make a wish in New Zealand, uh, Red Cross, save the children and different organizations that do some really amazing stuff, but they're terrible at talking to people. Yeah. They conduct us to go out there and do the talking for them. Nice. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, do you feel like, um, like what was the main reason that had you transition from, from that into, or I guess, how did you, how did you find out about remote closing? I guess was the next transition. Yeah. So I got married end of last year. Okay. And when me and the wife got married, I was kind of like, man, you know, doors is great, but anyone that's been in the door to door world that lives anywhere realizes that you don't have you cannot stay in the same spot you are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have to travel around at some extent. So for my setup, it was, I was in my hometown for three weeks and I go away for a week and newly married and everything. I didn't really want to be traveling that much away from the family. And I don't know, I just got back from my honeymoon and I got onto the doors and it was almost like my body said, no, <laughs> this isn't a lap. I, I don't want to continue. And I was like, whoa, this is weird because I had just been grinding the last like nearly three years, right? Mm -hmm. Three and a half years I've been doing this and I had never, ever felt like it was work. But on that day, it felt like work. Huh. What do you, what do you think was the the change other than like, you know, obviously you're getting married and or what was that it? It was just like, I don't want to be away. I think it was a big part of like that. But also when I, I went on my honeymoon for a couple, for like six weeks back to Bali, actually. I love Bali. I was literally, <laughs> I was actually going to say like, was it back to Bali? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent it was. It's a great time. Um, and what we ended up doing there 
um, was just like enjoying living life, you know, and like really enjoying being married at the beginning and having all that time together, but also having like the lifestyle because someone like Bali is so cheap, right? And like having the lifestyle that I've always wanted of time freedom, you know, like sure you make money in sales and money has always been a thing that will kind of come to the ones that work the hardest, you know, and put in the work. But that rarely comes with the time back and the freedom back of like location. So I think when I got back on the doors, it hit me like a ton of bricks that yes, I have money, but I don't have time or location freedom, meaning I am stuck where I am. And that just hit. I was like, I can't go to Bali tomorrow if I want to go back, <laughs> you know? So that kind of started the process. And, and then I think I went through that stage where any good entrepreneur does, where they kind of go through the bats of thinking of every single business that they can do <laughs> in order to, uh, to get that freedom. And to be honest, at that time, I thought I was not loving sales anymore. Like I genuinely thought I like had lost my passion. I was like, no, nah, I'm not into selling. Like maybe I can't do this. And I had like been crushing it the last three and a half years. So there's no reason for that. Right. But it just creeps in. And then I realized that I wasn't enjoying what I was doing and I wasn't enjoying what I was selling. Mm. So as soon as I started to chat with some of the different people and Funny enough, I, I jumped on and I actually saw your guys' podcast and hearing some of the other people. Oh, nice. Okay. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Hearing some of the other people that have gone through the journey and and how they made those transitions, it really like kind of opened my eyes of like, oh, you know what? I actually think I love selling, but I'm not enjoying what I'm selling anymore. Mm. You know, we, we had chatted off camera for a minute there about like, when you're finding an offer, you want to make sure it's something that you enjoy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if you do that, it's it's like you're not working. So it took me about four, four and a half months of like just trying out heaps of different businesses, seeing what I wanted to dabble in before I realized that, no, you know what? I still love sales. I just yeah. don't want to be selling in person anymore. What, uh, what, just curious, what were some of the things that you tried? Yeah, so I tried um, a drop shipping company. I tried SSS MMA. Um, I tried doing some like consulting for other businesses. Um, the whole Alex Hermosi style, you know yeah. what I mean? Of like start a, um, be a rainmaker, if you will, for a business. And don't get me wrong, I I loved a lot of those things, but I was getting bored right away. Like, I don't know why it just was like, it wasn't like satisfying me. And if I don't find like satisfaction in what I'm doing, I find it really hard to do it. So after a little while, I, like I said, I jumped on and I was watching some of your guys' videos and I was like, Hmm. Okay. I wonder about the selling thing. Why do you think you got bored? Cause, and the reason I'm going into this a little bit more is cause I think you're not the only person person that feels that way, you know? So I'm, I'm just trying to like, maybe open it up for other people that might be in the same spot of like, yeah, I like try this business. Cause I think there's, there, there's two sides of it, right? There's someone that tries drop shipping and they just like, don't see the success that they're looking for. So then they quit. But for you, it sounds like you were, you know, seeing relative success, but you just got bored. So like, why, why are you getting bored? Do you think? Yeah. So I think as soon as I started like looking into a few of those options, right? there wasn't as much pure communication aspect. Like, mm -hmm. yes, you have to communicate in every business, right? But I love communicating. And when I was on doors, like even though I was running the business, I led from the front. So every single day I was out on the doors actually mm -hmm. selling myself. And when I guess I came away from that and started trying to go into these other businesses, I was like, they're great. And like the money, it's, it's going to come. Like it, it, you can just kind of see it. But... I didn't enjoy the fact that I was just sitting behind a computer and not talking to someone. I was literally just like, you know, charts up in front of me. Okay. Grinding through the work. And I'm like, like, sure. If I have to do it a couple hours here and there, that, that stuff's the admin to me, it's work where when I get into a job, if I, if I truly want to do amazing at it, it cannot feel like work to me. Mm. Like, and historically, those are the things that I've always done best at. So I think that was the biggest thing was like, if something feels like work, it's probably not the best thing for you. You know what I yeah. mean? 
it's such a cliche, but they, they say like, find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I think that thing's okay if it changes. You know, you might have loved one thing in the past and then now that <laughs> is not a love at all and you want to get into something new, okay? But I think if you are getting into something new and you're going through that like path, you want to make sure that you are enjoying it. Do you know what I mean? Like you could just get into something new thinking, oh, this is going to be the thing. And then it isn't. But having the self-reflection to realize that and not just diving into it and continue to go through that cycle, but just be like, be self-aware, I guess, is the best way. And be mm -hmm. like, okay, no, I, I didn't enjoy that. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, you know, you being in that, that side of it though, is, is good. Cause like, you know, you could, you can be in, be in this position where you like, you try something and then you realize like, Hey, this isn't for me. Let me go try another thing. As opposed to where a lot of people stay stuck is like, Oh, I have this idea, but then they never like actually implement. So they don't even know like, Oh, is this going to be something that I enjoy or that I don't? So, you know, uh, one of the the things that I, to someone that's listening to this, um, you know, you'll never hear us say that like Amazon FBA, dropshipping, affiliate marketing, like all these other business models, you'll never hear us say that they don't work or you can't see success with them. But I do think that, you know, like, like you said, it's, it's go try those things, right? See if you will enjoy it. Cause someone might love drop shipping and the technical and whatever, but you know, back to what you said about just being kind of the center of attention as like a bartender is like you, you, you almost like thrive off of that. And I feel like I'm, I'm very much so the same way. Like I would just hate, like I had a, I had a social media marketing agency. I hated fulfillment. I hated running ads. I hated dealing with complaints. I hated all this stuff. I just wanted to like talk to people and help them. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny um, like that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So what's, um, so was it, so I guess that leads us into how you found, or so did you, you, you found us in the podcast and that you kind of just went down the rabbit hole there and you had a conversation and kind of the rest is history or was like, what was that process? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I found your guys a podcast and, um, I'm very much a researcher. So I like researched about 10 other companies <laughs> and like look, look through the ball and, Funny enough, the, the biggest test that I did was to see what I jumped onto my like consult call is how the person looked on video. Okay. What was their surrounding? What was their atmosphere like? Mm. And nine out of 10 times, they just weren't professional. It blew my mind. Like it was like some dude with a, a, a window behind them, lights coming at them. We could barely see them. I'm like, what is going on? This yeah. is mental. Uh, and then I jumped on with, um, with, with someone from RCA and, it was professional. And then afterwards he told me that he was traveling as well. And I was like, you have this nice of a setup and you're not at home. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, all right, there's something here. <laughs> there, there's a little bit of juice in it. It's funny enough, but that was like my, that was my deciding factor between this and a lot of other programs at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Dude, I actually want to touch on that because there was, uh, I was talking to, um, Ty, uh, one of our, our success coaches, and he just recently put out a training uh, within the group that was like an hour long training of like, like step-by-steps of how to get placed on, on offers. And like one of his biggest, uh, just biggest things is just the way that you show up. Right. So, you know, you, you kind of took it from that, that judge standpoint of, you know, we're teaching how to be remote closer. So like you want to, talk to a remote closer that's doing it in the right way. So you know that you're going to be taught the right way, right? That's a, that's a huge part of it. But, um, you know, anyone that's listening to this, that let's say you are trying to self source or, you know, find a gig or whatever. I think one of the easiest ways to just like stand out, right. Especially as depending on when you're listening to this, right. It's, it could be a very different game in a year from now when remote closing is more, uh, more well-known we'll say, um, one of the biggest things is like being a good salesperson might not be enough, right? Just that little bit of like, Hey, spend a couple hundred bucks on good lighting, a camera that maybe looks a little bit better, right? Don't be backlit. Like, uh, you know, like Liam said, and, and a lot of these just small things, even investing hundred bucks, 200 bucks into a, uh, into your setup could be a massive, uh, game changer for, you know, especially if you're, you're going to be on, you're going to be on video calls all day. So you got to set yourself up for success. Um, so, okay, cool. So you, so you jump into, into RCA, um, I guess, what were your initial thoughts and like, what was just like the, maybe the first week of, of RCA? Cause you, you did relatively quick ramp up. So just what was like, I guess, overall first impressions and what was the first steps? Yeah. So first thing first is, um, 
you know, I, I chatted with my coach, Mitch, and he told me, you know, okay, I want you to go through A, B, and C, you know, the just the, the intro stuff, the intro stuff, right? Go through that, and then we'll talk about, like, next steps. And I remember our next call was scheduled for, like, four days later. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I did all of that. Well, before I did any of that, I literally jumped onto a mock call and was just trying to mock call people before learning anything. Uh, like, I'll just listen to them. I was like, I'm just going to listen to whatever they said and yeah. see if I can re- regurgitate that back to them, <laughs> which is quite funny. Ended up meeting a couple of really amazing people at the beginning, got them all to send me like their scripts so I could start to like have something to actually read instead of yeah. not just to have that beginning. Um, and then I was like, okay. I was like, and I started to realize they had like a bit of a system. Every single one of them had a bit of a system. I was like, huh. I was like, there's probably something in here. So <laughs> I started to go through the training at that point, like a day in. And to be honest, I just dived in. Like I went into it as much as I could. I'm running a company. I'm doing other things. But in order to get something like this going, you need to devote yourself to actually putting in the work, you know? So I think that's a big thing that I did as I just jumped in. I did, um, I don't know, I, I watched probably five, six hours of videos right away and just like just ramped down, try, rewatched probably a handful of them over and over and over. <laughs> just I was like, huh, <laughs> let's read, re- let's read yeah. that data set, you know, <laughs> let's do it again. Um, and yeah, that was kind of like my introduction to it. And I think the big thing, that I did from there and why I took off right away and why I got on an offer right away was I didn't wait, you know, and this is just something in general in life. I feel like a lot of people think that they have to be quote unquote ready before they take those next steps. But I'm a big believer. You're never ready. Like like I'm I'm a huge believer. You're whenever you go to start something, you're going to be not ready, even if you think you are. Mm. So it's better to just get that process over with because you're going to fail at the beginning. You may as well fail when you know nothing. And then as you continue to learn, you're getting better, but you're already in the process. Mm-hmm. So I think I started cold outreach, looking for people, um, I don't know, four days in. Oh, <laughs> man. Know? And like just reaching out, I was like, okay, yeah, I've watched a couple of videos. If I get a job tomorrow, I'll wing it. You know, it'll be all good. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be golden. Uh, and yeah, I just started like the first videos I watched was just on outreach. How, how do I go and land? A, how do I go and land a role? Um, and like looked through everything there, and then tried to commute it not just on those channels, but on every channel that I could think of as well. You know, like use the the gray matter in between the head a little bit and. Just try to apply it as much as I could. Hey, what's going on, Aaron? Just popping in to the episode really quickly. So at this point, you've already listened half of this episode. So I'm assuming that you're at least somewhat interested in remote closing and how you can learn a little bit more about it. So I put together a free training. You can go ahead and click the link down in the description or in the show notes if you're listening on the podcast. Click that link. Don't go watch it yet because we still have another half of the episode here of the success story of RCA. Just open it up and just so you don't forget that you can go check out that video. It's going to go over not only what remote closing is, but also the four-step process of what I would do if I was starting from scratch, starting over to still see a success online using remote closing. So that being said, let's jump back into the episode. Click the link down to the below. We'll see you on the other side. It's hard to like, even put the mindset into words and like explain to people. I really think it, it is hard, hardwired into, into certain people. Not, not, as, not that it's something that can't be learned, but I'm, I'm very much so like, you know, recently there was a, uh, this, this program that I jumped into. It was like this, well, a couple months ago, um, like a weight loss kind of like, you know, accountability type thing. And yeah, within the first like day, I was like, how do I set up my tracker? How do I, you know, set up my like onboarding call with my coach? How do I stay the most accountable? Right. Just like, cause and maybe it's just from the past of, and maybe I don't know if you can relate to this, but just in the past, like knowing the process of, I know because I've invested into this thing and it's something that works. So my goal is always to get, okay, how can I get to that end result as quickly as humanly possible to recoup investment or, you know, hit the gauge of success, right? So you can, in your brain, have a much quicker uh, association between I did this and this is the result that I got, right? I think with the people, a lot of people do it in the inverse. Uh, and that's why people always call things scams, right? If they join it, it's like they join something, they don't do anything. And they're like, oh, that was another scam. I didn't, you know, make $10,000 overnight by doing nothing. This is strange. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know exactly. if it's the same, yeah. I don't know if it's the same thing with, uh, with you. 
No, 100%. And I think because I had come from the door-to-door side, I almost, like, I, obviously, I, I look up and I see heaps of people and, and I watch some of those videos like, oh, like, closers, it's not a not a thing that's going to continue. But I can I went from the side of people in my industry that I've hired and that I've come through what I've done in, in door-to-door always said, like, oh, man, this is, this is a scam, like, talking to people at their home, which is literally the oldest form of sales. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, quote, unquote, a new scam. So uh, I guess I had been around that side so much that I was just like, there's going to be haters. There's going to be people that don't like what you do slash didn't succeed at it themselves. Mm. So they're going to put their beliefs of that onto you. And I just had to, at the beginning, I was like, okay, going into something, know that you know take everything that you hear with a grain of salt you know like try try and pick through don't don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of stuff (laughs) i mean and doing that i think it allowed me to be able to get in and just like okay yeah no i hear some other people but at the same time i knew if i put in the work i knew if i applied what i've been taught like that rca doesn't produce people that are selling 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 in commissions a month without doing something right. You know what I mean? And they're not as big as they are without actually getting results. So I knew that it wasn't going to be the fault of the program. If I didn't succeed, I probably just didn't actually work. And I didn't want that to be my limiting factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a huge part that you, that you touched on that is super important. And even almost every single episode that I've, that I've done at this point is you know that when when people call something a scam or they don't think that it's it's real right a lot of the times it's just going to come back to their own previous experiences right like what happened and they try to take those experiences and then put them onto you um there's a it's funny i was searching up you know i'm always doing like nerdy research on youtube about like what what are people saying about appointment setting and closing and stuff and there was one guy it was just like He's uh he's just sitting like in his garage and you know I think the the title of it was like why appointment settings a scam or something and literally he didn't I watched through the video and he didn't talk anything about how remote clo- or you know appointment setting was a scam he just talked about how he was sold into an MLM to be an appointment setter and therefore the entire industry of appointment setting is a scam <laughs> and I'm like no bro it's not a scam you just fell for an MLM like that's, that's let's call it what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so yeah it's it's you know a lot of times just based on the experiences so if you're listening to this and your parents or your you know uh friends are saying like don't fall for another like online business model thing i agree do your research right look and see the successes that are coming from the programs that you're starting before you invest but i think that'll just come down to the research that needs to be done anyway um okay so you go through and you you take massive action so what was, I guess, the time frame from jumping in and then the process or, yeah, the timeline of like having your first interviews, how'd you land your first interview? Um, let's maybe talk like numbers of what that looked like of like outreach and and time frame. Yeah. So funny enough, I, first day, first day the oh, shoot, okay. one today is the offer is like one of the first people that I reached out to. Nice. Funny enough. Um, but it wasn't that quickly. You know, I reached out to the guy and I reached out on Twitter, actually, which I think is a uh, path that is extremely underutilized by people huh. to get jobs. Money okay. Twitter is such a real thing. Mm. OK, you follow the right people. There's job opportunities literally posted every single day. OK, so I jumped into there and I messaged the right people and I was simply sending a message like this. Hey, I'm really new to this side of sales but these are my experiences previously. Okay. Mm. And this is like what I've been able to do. If you know anyone, not yourself, but if you know anyone that's looking for a closer, please let them know. I'm, I'm happy to do anything to start. Okay. Mm. And I sent that message to probably, I don't know, 50 people my first day, literally just quick DM, quick DM, personalize it slightly per person, but just sent out heaps of those. Um, and that was kind of like before I even watched the recruiting side of the video it was literally yeah. like first day i was just like i, I need to talk to people <laughs> send, send, send messages that, that'll start yeah. something. uh but from there I, I went through the the methods i went on to facebook i probably responded to i don't know a couple hundred couple hundred posts easily into there and i landed another 
I landed another um, interview with another company that does what I do. So I literally now what I do now. <laughs> and they were the same kind of coaching offer, but just based yeah. in the States instead of based in the UK and Dubai. So I was like, okay, cool. And I literally just played the game of continuing to message until I had a contract signed in front of me and a full schedule of calls. I was like, mm-hmm. I'm not treating it like I have anything. So I just continued that process. Um, I think overall, I outreached probably three, 400 places. Wow. I got four, no, five different job um, interviews. From mm-hmm. there, I landed three of the gigs. And then it was literally just waiting to see whose process I like best and whose program I like best. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So you, so really you, you took the, uh, and I love this, this mindset of like, just basically making it and taking so much action on the front end that it makes it inevitable, right? That most people do it in the opposite. They say, well, I'm going to reach out to like five people and oh my gosh, like this didn't work. Like, why didn't I get placed onto a $10,000 offer by, you know, spending 15 minutes on outreach. Right. Um, so, you know, anyone that's listening to this and you can take this mindset with literally anything in life. Like it's, it's super freaking cliche, but it's true. It's like, you know, if if you want to lose 10 pounds, right. Do the things that, you know, that's going to help you lose weight. Right. There's no secret. There's no magic pill. There's no secret sauce. Right. It's like burn more calories than you bring in and then like move your body and get some steps in and don't sit on the couch all day. Like if you just do that simple thing, you're going to see like some results. Now, obviously, if you do enough action on the front end of eating right every single day, going to the gym, you know, X amount of times per week, adding some cardio, and I'm just taking regurgitating this from what I'm learning <laughs> from the program that I'm in. Um, but it's like, you know, you got to you gotta take like the massive action. You had, like you said, you landed three gigs. You didn't just land one or two, you landed three. And then you were then able to uh, be selective and, you know, almost have that, that abundance mind, mindset versus scarcity and say, okay, this one checks all the boxes. I'm going to go with that one as opposed to like settling for one and then, you know, ending up switching down the road anyway. Yeah. That's a, that's a good mindset. Um, so how, I just curious, how long did that, that outreach take? Cause I think that's like the next, like someone might be saying, oh my gosh, 400 pieces of outreach. Like how long did you spend? Do you think collectively on, on the outreach? I don't know. Um, like. I, I know it happened within like two weeks. So like, okay. yeah. H- how many hours in there? Ooh. So you call it like five, six hours, maybe yeah. maybe seven hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, why is like, I went with the approach and I think this is just because like my door to door background. Yeah. More numbers, ratios. Okay. Ratios yep. always come. All of averages. Like, <laughs> exactly, man. Exactly. If I send a hundred messages, surely I'm going to have at least a 1% answer, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, and I did, I had, I had better than that. And I knew it would be the case. So I didn't even spend too much time, which later learning, I probably would have gotten a little bit better results with a little bit less input if I would have mm-hmm. been more, more personalized. But I, 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 in a sense, made a pretty uh, bulk message and I just adjusted it very minorly per person that I sent it to and just boom, just banged it out, banged it out, banged it out. Yeah. So like going for the number mass, I figured if someone responds then I can give them a full on in-depth personalized message. Mm-hmm. But until they do, why why would you waste too much time? You know what I mean? Yeah. Find the person that's going to at least first respond to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, even, you know, even if someone did one third of that, you know, I think that the, you know, you're obviously going to get what you, you get out, what you, what you put in. Um, but I think that just, and the reason I asked about the amount of time is to help people understand that like, it doesn't take that long, right? It's like collectively in a week, that six hours is probably going to something else stupid, right? It's scrolling on social media, right? Uh, you know, watching Netflix, whatever it is. So that's, I think that'll be, that'd be super helpful. So someone can just like, you know, tangibly be like, okay, six hours on the clock. Let's, let's do some outreach. Um, okay. So, so you, you reach out to these companies, you have the interview, you get placed. Uh, I guess what was the, like the interview process? Cause people are always at wondering, we talk a lot about like leading up to that. So what would like the interview process, what was that like? And then maybe anything that you learned that, um, that you can send to anyone else that's in the same spot. Yeah. So funny enough, the interview process, and I think this probably was one of the reasons I ended up going with this company. But it was so laid back. It, it was like one of the chillest, um, 
the guy himself had experience doing door-to-door fundraising as well. So we just like bonded and clicked right away. Um, but on the other ones, I started with like a group interview. And then mm. from that group interview, I went on to a single interview, did a single interview. And then from there, was basically offered the job on the spot. Okay. So that's kind of the process that happened for the other two. But mm-hmm. for the one I ended up taking, the role actually wasn't for a closer, which is what I'm working as. It was for like a um, a cold outreach person. So like to mm-hmm. go through all of the calls that had been missed or that didn't get followed up with, my job was going to be reaching out to all of them because like I had heaps of experience in cold calling, right? Mm-hmm. And I got on the call and I was like, yo, bro, that's awesome. Not what I want to do. <laughs> I was like, I, I think awesome. I'd be much better as your closer. <laughs> I think you give me some uh, some leads that are going to be good. I got this. We got this. This will be some yeah. fun. Um, and end up chatting with them. I don't know. Spent probably like 20, 30 minutes on the phone with them. And at the end of it, he's like, yeah, you know what? No, 100% agree. <laughs> Let, let's get that. <laughs> and I was like, yes. Yeah, I like it. Let, let's do it. Uh, well, but, and, amazing. amazing yeah. Guy. And that's, and that's just the testament because you literally closed him on the idea of letting you be the closer. So he probably knew like, okay, this is like, if he's going to close me on this idea, then he's, he's going to be golden. <laughs> but to get to the point of jumping on a call with him, and, and this I think is actually the most crucial part of landing an offer, mm. is your follow-up game from the day you message to the day you talk to them, okay? Because mm. even though I said like I sent out that many messages, I sent out so many replies from messages that weren't answered okay and just like bumping it back up bumping it back up because the way i looked at it is as like a closer as a setter you're gonna have to be persistent like your whole job is following up and if you're not following up with the offer that you're trying to get onto you're just showing them the level of skills that you're gonna have for following up with customers. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to treat them like I treat a customer. And literally every second day I sent them a message. If I heard from them, I didn't hear from them. And the guy I ended up like getting involved with, I got him on his Twitter. I got him on his Instagram. I got his WhatsApp number. And I just rotate every, every day. I'd send him a message on one of the three until I got my, my, my uh, interview with him, which was like a week and a half later from the day we introduced messages. Yeah. You know, literally just every day, sent him a message. Hey, bro, really excited for our interview. Anything I can do to prepare? Hey, man, super excited to get on an interview. What day works for you? Hey, man, really excited about your offer. Do you mind sending me some content so I can learn about it? And just sending these kind of messages literally to everyone that I had an interview or that I had communications with. Because I think a lot of people, they just jump in and they send a message and they're like, I didn't get a reply. Damn. And they just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's, and that, that's so huge. Cause you want to like, you want to see the idea of what it's going to be like to, to work with you. It, it's funny that, that very similar thing happened. Uh, you know, when I, back when I had my, you know, agency, obviously, you know, I still do a lot of follow up. but, um, when I, when I had one of the first clients that I brought on, I'll never forget is that it was a real estate agent and it was very similar. It's just like, I would just like keep following up, keep following up. And a lot of like my colleagues or other, you know, people in the, the social media marketing space, they would ba- make kind of that same excuse of like, Oh, I like reached out to this person and I'm not getting any responses. And I'm like, well, how many times did you follow up? And they're like, uh, well, like I none. <laughs> and it's like, well, no shit. Like if you don't do follow up, they're not going to like expect you, like you're literally about to follow up with their clients for them through ads. So if you can't follow up and show that you can do that, it's like, they're not going to, you know, you want to, you want to, again, seed the idea of like the work ethic and the follow-up that's going to happen before you're even hired. And you know, that will, that will help out a lot because you're demonstrating your, your ability just through communications with them. Um, exactly. And I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll even, you know, put a, put a testament to that as like, Liam followed up with me, like you followed up with me on, uh, on school and was like, Hey, can I like do anything to get ready for this, for this interview? And I'm like, no dude, we're just gonna have a, a conversation. So, um, testament to you on that one. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. I know we, we have about 10 minutes here. So let's, um, let's talk about, you know, the just first month within your offer. Cause the, some of the numbers are are pretty insane from what you've been able to do. So let's just talk about that. You know, what was like the outreach numbers? Um, you know, everyone's always wondering about like, how much money did you make? What was the commission? So let's, let's touch a little bit on that if we can. Of course. So first month in, okay. 
I did 256 calls, first off. Um, like I said, I'm on a closing offer, so I had my schedule, and I gave them my schedule on Calendly, and they just fill it in with people that I need to chat with, okay? My schedule, I opened it up from 9.30 a.m. to 1, p. 1 a.m., okay? And that's my schedule opened up every Damn. single day that first month, okay? Because I knew what I lacked in skills, I was going to make up for in numbers, Okay. And that was the whole game plan. Grind my ass off the first month. I'm going to be good enough so I can work somewhat regular hours <laughs> later on yeah. and be able to do same results. Cause I've already put what I like to call paying down my ignorance debt. Mm. Okay. So anyway, did 256 calls, ended up sending over, I think it was like over 500 emails, over 500 text messages as follow-ups. I ended up closing Two hundred and ten thousand dollars U.S. dollars in revenue, and I collected one hundred and sixty-nine thousand in cash collected. So, for anyone that's listening in the whole like online space, it's one thing to say you generated a big amount, yeah. Like future earnings, it's a bigger thing to actually collect the cash on that. Okay, because you always get paid on cash collected. So, from that, my commission ended up being just over sixteen thousand dollars U.S. for first month. Yeah. I, I I was letting I was letting it sit there for a second cuz I want people to like understand um just and it's it's just this recurring thing that I that I'm seeing with you dude is like you just put in so much freaking action that you're just making the end result inevitable, right? It's like you same thing with the door-to-door stuff. You're knocking on a billion doors to make make sure you can get that first Bali vacation, right? Then you're doing enough outreach on the just to get an interview. And then you're doing like, again, the, the, the ignorance that you said, like, it's such a, it was such a cool, just like, maybe cool is not the right word, but it, it, it's a cool experience. And to be able to see, like, you're just taking like what is there and just kind of taking it to that, to that next level. What, um, if any, what were some of the, like the challenges in that process of, of the first month, if you can, you know, lay it out there for anyone else that might be in the same spot? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think like realize that at the beginning you are going to make mistakes and like, that's completely okay. Like the amount of calls that I re listened to later on, I was like, man, I could have closed that person. If I know what I know today, I would have closed them. But realizing, especially when you're first getting into it, that you're going to have a ramp up period where you're not going to close every person. You're not going to get the results that you necessarily want every single day. But if you do it for long enough, the results are there. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. like, the biggest triumph is like not getting discouraged because in the sales game, it's always been a case of numbers. You know what I mean? You talk to enough people, people will buy. And that same thing applies to closing because you're still selling. You know what I mean? Same thing applies for setting when you're getting those appointments. If you judge yourself completely off of one person, okay, your one bad day, you're never going to get the results that you wanted. You know, I didn't close my first deal for the first four days. <laughs> like mm. no deals closed till the first for the fourth day. And then I closed three on that day. You know what I mean? Mm. And like, it isn't like it was something where, oh, day one, I smashed it. Day two, I smashed it. You know what I mean? Like it was a slow process where I think that was the biggest thing I had to go with. Cause like, obviously I love to succeed right away, but just realizing that, Hey, just because I didn't see results today doesn't mean they're not coming. All right. And the first deal I ever called, closed, it was a pipeline deal from four days earlier. Yeah. <laughs> it was like one of the first calls I ever took. He ended up like getting involved. Four days later, he sends me a response to my follow-up email. And he's like, yes. He's like, I, I'm keen to do it. Let's, let's get this going. And that was my first ever deal as a follow-up. I was like, man, how does follow-up not happen? You know, you got to do it. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's, that's a, that's a great story. And like, again, talking about the follow-up it's, it's as cliche as it is, it's fortunes in the follow-up and it's, it served you right more than, than m multiple times. So you got to keep doing it and you'll, you know, it, you'll obviously see the results from that. Um, actually going back really quickly, you know, and, and, you know, bringing future and, and current what, um, what, if any differences do you see from selling the offer that you are now to selling the door-to-door -door stuff that we were doing. And the place that I'm trying to get with this is there's a lot of people that will listen to this that 
are in your same spot of like they're currently in sales or they're doing door to door, they're selling solar, they're doing real estate, they're doing mortgage, whatever. Um, talk about the differences that you see maybe from like an offer standpoint, but also like emotionally behind like the conviction of, of that, what you were doing before versus now. Yeah. So I'd say the biggest thing in there is compared to like the offer itself, like obviously I was working with a great thing on doors, like charity. It's, it's amazing. Charity is great. How can you not yeah. want to help charity? But the thing I always lacked there was knowing people got the value of what it was, you know what I mean? Making sure that mm. value exchange was even. And when I got onto the online side, it almost seems like they follow that 110 rule where they make someone else a hundred dollars and they charge them $10. Do you mm. know what I mean? The value and what they give is so much more than what they charge. Even if those numbers are astronomically high, mm. it's because they're getting even bigger results. So just kind of like realizing that side of it, if that makes sense. And being able to know the value that you're giving them. that That's what I found. Like the conviction, I could just talk with absolute conviction. I had hundreds and thousands of testimonials that I can talk about. You know, I have people that have done it. I could see it firsthand. You know, I, I knew it was the best offer because I came from a place of abundance. So I knew it was the best offer out of a few others in that industry. So I think that also kind of came into that conviction side of it, of being able to sell because I had already done my homework. But on the other side, the big thing that it made me feel was just free. Anyone that's in sales right now and you're doing it in person, you probably feel stuck to that location. I know I did, okay? Where you're like, man, whether it be the doors, whether you're a car salesman, whether you're selling um, you know, health equipment, whatever it might be, you're kind of stuck wherever they want to put you and wherever they want to send you. You can't go on a holiday tomorrow. You can't leave and go across the world and, and you know travel Brazil. You can't go anywhere without them giving you approval. Where when I transitioned onto online closing, I'm my boss. I decide where I want to work. I decide when I want to work. I decide how and where I take those calls. You know, and it's just a level of like, a freedom that came onto my chest that was just like, I can breathe. If I want to go back to Bali next month, I can go to Bali for a month and, and work from there. You know, like there's nothing stopping me from that. And it's funny because it's not even that I'm going to go and do that right away, but knowing that I can mm. makes me love it so much more. Yeah, man, that's, that's huge because I mean, just that last sentence is, it's not even that I, I feel very much so feel the same way. It's like, it's not so much that, yeah, I mean, I can't say it any better than you did, but it's not so much that like, I'm going to go do that tomorrow. Right. And, and travel the world and whatever, but just knowing that you can and have that freedom for me, you know, I have, I have three kids and uh, it's just knowing that like, if one of them got sick, right. I know that I can not take calls for the day, right? I can like go help my child, which like it might it might seem weird, but a lot of people don't live in that, right? They have to like ask to get off of work and then possibly not even get that. And it's like, they have to choose the job over anything else, right? That's just just my example. But yeah, dude, that's, that's, that's massive. 100%, man. I mean, like I'm actually, I'm having my first baby in September. Nice, you know? dude. Congrats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a wee girl, man, a wee girl. Hey, let's go. Good luck. I have two. They're fun. <laughs> uh, uh, there we go. There we go, mate. I'll, I'll have to ask you for some pointers after this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'll put together a course uh, and offer. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Let's do it, mate. I, I got you. <laughs> now, with, with that in mind, though, knowing that if something did happen to them, I can relate to that heavily because, like, she's not here yet, but I know I want to be present. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I know that if she's have if my wife's having a bad day with the baby, I can just say, I I'm off tomorrow, boys. You know what I mean? I'm not taking any calls. And like, you can do that to a certain extent with a regular job, but not really. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they're, at a certain point, they're going to get annoyed at you. If you're trying to take like, but where I can literally set my calendar to the hours I know my baby's going to sleep, the hours where I know the wife's going to sleep, and I can just work in those times. And no one's going to tell me not to do that. You know, it, it literally is set by me. And that's such a weight lifted off my chest. Mm -hmm. you know, that It can just, I get to work around my family. 
and I don't have to work my family around work. Yeah, dude, that's that. Uh, I could go on like a whole other 10 minute conversation with you about this. We'll, we'll have to bring you in for like, a, a th- I've been saying this with a lot of people, just like six month uh, check-ins, I think should be like a rolling thing that we have. So we'll, you know, I'll reach out. And at that point, we'll yeah. be able to tell the, the real uh, time of you having a baby and being a remote closer at the same time. I think it'll be, that, it'll be fun. We'll be able uh, okay, to chat so, about it. Yeah, I'm going to do the outro really quickly. Um, And, you know, we'll obviously I just want you to think about uh, just your biggest tip or trick or golden nugget that you'd give to someone that is either thinking about jumping in as a remote closer or maybe they're already a closer and, you know, you want to give them just a piece of advice. So just think about that really quickly. I'm going to do this outro. So uh, for those of you that are listening, I mean, this is one of our longer episodes and I love the longer ones because that means we're having a good conversation and I think it's something you guys will enjoy. So at this point, you've been listening for like an hour, so you're probably somewhat interested in remote closing, what it is and how you can get started. Um, At the very least, if you just want to learn more about remote, what remote closing is and, you know, we put together a video. I actually recently did one. It's about 45 minutes. It's down in the description if you're on YouTube, uh, in the show notes, if you're on the podcast app and uh, very much so it's just a four-step process. Here's what remote closing is. Here's how to get started here. You know, agnostic, if you do work with us or not, like you can take the information from this video and and go implement. Now, that being said, at the end of it, uh, there will be an option to you know jump on a call with us and figure out what it'd be like for us to literally hold your hand through the process, very similar to how we did with Liam. And uh, we can talk about that. But again, it's the point of the training was just give basically everything for free and, and give you the action plan. So if you want to check that out, down in the description on uh, YouTube and in the show notes over on the podcast app. So Liam, hopefully I gave you enough time. What you got in terms of your tips? Yeah, I think it... You're probably not going to be surprised when I say it, but it's the power of follow-up. Like whether it be you're just starting it off and you're trying to find an offer, whether it be you're already in an offer and you want to just up your closing rate or up your setting rate, and whether you're already in there and you just want to make sure you're closing more deals and you're finding those next opportunities. Like um, something exciting is I'm looking at already after only I've done it a month of following into a sales manager role, you know, for the company. Nice. So I'm harassing them every day about that, (laughs) you know? And, and I think the biggest nugget in there is like, whether it be sales or literally anything, follow up about it. Okay. If someone said they were going to get back to you and they haven't follow up, if they said they'll get back to you in two weeks time, follow up in between. Why would you leave it two weeks? Maybe they'll get you that information sooner. Maybe you'll find a decision sooner. You know, I, when I bought my house, okay, I literally followed up with the, um, the agent. I followed up with the lawyers. I followed up with my, uh, everyone involved every single day. I was like, sweet, what's the update? What's happening? What's the update? What's happening? And it can be applied to anything in life, but especially sales, because we're all human and we're all have such busy, hectic lives where they don't even mean not to follow up with you. It just, life happens. Life gets busy. Life is just what it is. So if you can be that person that's the top of their notification, they've seen it come through a few times, they're not going to think, oh my gosh, this person's so annoying. They're going to be like, oh, right. I forgot to answer him. Perfect. Let me get on to that. Yeah. And a caveat to that, if they do think you're super annoying, then, hey, at least you've exhausted your opportunity completely. And you you know, that's probably not the person you want to be with anyway. Yep. Dude, I think just nail nail in the coffin, uh, you know, bow on top, relentless follow-up will get you anything in life. And it sounds like, you know, you've you've implemented that same structure into pretty much everything that you've done and it's it's helped you out a lot. Um, so dude, I just want to say thank you so much for for hanging out with us for the past hour. I think a lot of people will get a ton out of this, whether they are in sales, they're thinking about jumping into RCA, not doesn't matter. I think anyone listening to this could get a ton from this. So uh, for those that are listening, uh, leave a comment down below. Let us know what you think, some thoughts uh, of the episode. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Uh, my name is Aaron from the Remote Closing Academy podcast. And Liam, once again, thanks so much for jumping on. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Talk soon. Peace.